I'm Rob Moore. And I'm Lee Moore. This is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Lee, introduce our guest for today. Well, his name is Nick Stimber. He is the uh, translator for a uh, pretty famous contemporary short story novelist, uh, Jia Pinghua. Among other things. Among other things. He's, he's uh, you know, an incredible person, very handsome, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Uh, we're interviewing him over Skype today, although we got the chance to actually talk with him when he stopped by the U of O campus a couple of weeks ago, right? Yep, and we're going to be shamelessly plugging uh, at least a pair of websites that Nick helms, one of which is actually on Chinese manga, Yeah, which is... Which is an amazing website. It's fascinating. What's the name yeah. of that website, Nick? Uh, well, the name of the website is just uh, nickstemper.com. Okay. So an easy one. Um, yeah, it's an easy one. Um, but I, I guess the, the technical name I use for it is the Encyclopedia Mount Aquatica. Okay. So. And we'll put links to these up on the, the podcast site. So. Yeah. And then his second website, of course, deals with the Chinese writer Jia Pinghua. Right. So, Nick, tell us a little bit about what you do with Jia Pinghua and who Jia Pinghua is. Um, so, Jia Pinghua is uh, he's an author of contemporary Chinese fiction. Um, he was born in uh, the 1950s in China, mainland China. Um, and he was born in kind of rural Shanxi <laughs> province. So Shanxi province is one of the more um, kind of out of the way corners of China now. Um, but you know, of course, traditionally it was the, the kind of the Chinese homeland. Um, and Jia Pinghua, he writes what would be considered rural fiction. So a lot of his stories deal with characters from the countryside um, who have come to the city, or often just characters in the countryside um, and their experience of different historical events in China. Um, so my uh, work with Yapping Wise, I met him in uh, March 2016 uh, for the first time, and I gave a talk uh, in Xi'an on uh, translating literature, so about how to bring, how I, my experience of bringing uh, literature into, Chinese literature into English, uh, mostly comics, um, but also science fiction. And so when I was working with, uh, when I was talking to Xi'an, I was kind of giving him some of my ideas about how we could present more of his literature and more of his work into English. Um, so it's kind of how we got started, and then um, through that kind of partnership, we launched this project to uh, translate some of his novels, or translate samples of his novels called The Ugly Stone Project. Hmm. Which is, of course, also, we'll get to this in a second, the title of the story we'll be talking about yeah. today. Lee and I, and I, I think this is true for you, tell me if this is wrong, Lee, but Lee and I had not actually read Xia Pinghua until we met Nick. Yeah, I had vaguely heard about him. I mean, I don't do contemporary stuff as much as you do, Rob, but... Uh, it, he he is very well. Tell me, Nick, how big is Zhang Pinghua in kind of contemporary Chinese literature? Well, I, I say Zhang Pinghua. He's one of the uh, the top writers definitely in China today. Um, one of the most well known authors of Chinese literature among Chinese readers. Okay. Um, but I think for people who are reading you know, Chinese literature and translation, they're not as familiar with his work because. Uh, very few of his novels have actually been translated into English. Yep. Mm. So, so far, he's only had two books mm. that are available in English right now. And those are what? Um, the first... Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, though, those were what? Tell, tell us the titles. All right, so the, the first one was Turbulence, which was I think came out in 1992. The translation was a book that he had written, uh, Fu Zhao is the Chinese title of the book, and that was, I believe, 89 is when it came out in Chinese. Um, and that was translated by Howard Goldblatt. And then his latest book that came out was actually published in 1992 in Chinese, uh, Fei Du, or Abandoned Capital, as it's often known. Now, the most uh, recent translation is Rune City is the title that they use. Um, but it's also translated by Howard Gold. And that just came out last year uh, in January 2016 with Oklahoma University Press. And that's his, um, most, so, mm -hmm. oh, that's his most famous book in China, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think... Uh, Rune City is, is definitely his most famous book in China, um, mostly because it, there's a lot of controversy around the book. It was um, banned for obscenity, essentially, um, in, I think it was actually like a couple months after the book came out, it was banned. We should point um, out it's banned for obscenity, but it's also based off of a very classical book that we'd like to talk more about eventually, the Jinping Mei, the Plum in the Golden Vase. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I think... 
you know, it's, it's arguable about how much he, he, he drew from this book. But when I met with him, actually, in, in last year's site, that was one of the first things I asked him about. It's like, hey, did you read Jim Ping Mei? <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I read this in, you know, back in, like, the you know late 70s when it was still kind of verboten in China. Um, and I got, like, this, you know, a, a, a bootleg copy of the book. It's still um, kind of verboten in China, sort of, right? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's still not something that's super accessible. And I know... Um, from from studying it at uh, UBC, so when I took a course in the Jimmy Mae with uh, Catherine Zweck, um, she was talking about how there's certain versions of the book that are very hard to get a hold of in China. So hmm. um, certain of this, the more there's like redacted versions that are available, but then some of the more explicit versions are harder to find. Yeah. You mean that we were like trying to get a hold of, say, a proper copy of the Decameron to teach? <laughs> now, you don't find a lot of lit classes, say, for undergrads and below that teach the Decameron because yeah. that would just be impossible. Right. Um. Yeah. I wanted to ask you. So, so he's one of the top. Jia uh, Ping Wai is one of the top writers in contemporary Chinese literature. But when I think of the top most famous guy, I always think of Mo Yan. And you mentioned that Jia uh, Ping Wai is considered a, a writer of rural fiction. Mo Yan is also a writer of rural fiction, but there are a lot of differences. And I was wondering if you could kind of compare and contrast the two for us. So if, if you're going to compare Moya to the Japanese Wa, um, which I think is something that a lot of a lot of readers in English are going to do, because obviously Moya is the most well-known Chinese author, um, having won the, the Nobel Prize, um, and also you know Moya is, is kind of famous for being this this rural author, kind of that same that same mold as uh, Japanese Wa and some other other authors from this time period. Um, but I, I think the the big difference between Moya and Japanese Wa is that um, Japanese Wa was uh, first of all, I think he, he he's actually from the countryside, whereas Moyen is not. Moyen <laughs> was, was sent down. <laughs> so, it, I think it, in a way, you know, Japanese he, he comes to you know, you could say you, he comes at it more honestly. Could uh, could we say that Moyen is kind of? Hmm? Could we say that uh, Moyen is a bit of a rural writer poser? <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't. I don't know if I go quite so far as saying that he's a poser, but I think that um, Moyen, he, he's definitely trying for a certain effect. So he's trying to create this this idea of kind of an idealized version of, of rural society. Um, okay. Whereas I think uh, uh, Japanese Wa, in a sense, I think he's he's more relying on his own experiences, um, and I, I think also Japanese Wa. Um, what's really interesting about him is that his father is actually a school teacher, um, so Japanese Wa had. You know, a very, a very strong foundation in the classics from a pretty young age. Um, so I think when we, we look at some of Japanese writing, you can see a lot of um, uh, connections to earlier styles of Chinese writing. So especially like Story of the Stone, right, um, or, or, or Jin Ping Mansion, mm-hmm. as it's known, yeah. or Jin Ping Mei. Um, so like this Ming and Qing vernacular fiction. I think a lot of that that stuff crops up in Japanese writing. So even though he's writing about a contemporary period. He's using these older forms in a way that I think very few authors um, in China today are able to do. Hmm. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and dive into the story that we had on tap for today because yeah. I think that will give people a better idea, a little more concrete idea of what we're talking about. The story is called The Ugly Stone. Um, the, the basic shell of the plot, and I'm really only going to give the shell of the plot. It's a fairly short story. It's a very short story. Um, is set in a village where there's... Well, an ugly stone that sits outside of a house, and the, the it's first-person narrative. The writer reflects on how ugly it is. No one knows why it's there, what it's for. Uh, it doesn't they, really have any uses. It doesn't seem to have any uses except that there's a little divot on top that collects rainwater and the chickens drink out of it. So people make fun of it. Uh, no one can seem to figure out what to do with it. And one day, a passerby they've never seen before stops in his tracks, stares at it, and proceeds to take up residence in the village and investigate it. And it turns out that what we're looking at is not just an ugly stone, but a piece of a meteorite. And that stranger is not just any person. It's a an astronomer, right? Yes. Uh, we try to figure out by the end he's an astronomer. And the story ends with the narrator reflecting on how fascinating it is that this piece of a meteorite that is essentially a ball of fire streaking across the sky, across the universe, ends up at his doorstep. Yeah, and I mean, one of the contrasts that he puts up is, you know, he's just in this kind of, uh, I, I hesitate to use the word, but kind of 
backwoods rural village and this rock was once kind of soaring around through outer space and right. the kind of contrast in the the distance I yeah guess. yeah so when Lee and I read this uh I was really struck by it I had not actually read Xiao Pinghua before this story and when I first started I, I had literally knew nothing about their author I didn't Wikipedia and Google and nothing and I started off thinking it was an, a much older story because of its concision, because of uh, how simply it's narrated. But it very quickly became clear that it's a very modern story, the way that the author is reflecting on what's happening. But I'm curious to hear both of your thoughts when you were reading it, maybe for the first time. Nick's obviously read it much more than we have. but Yeah, I don't know. For me... Uh... It definitely didn't seem like anything that I had read in contemporary Chinese fiction. Uh, it was not concerned with uh, – there, there was no political overtones whatsoever. And I'm oftentimes used to – I mean I, when I read Moyen, he's – oftentimes he'll write about kind of historical matters. I'm particularly thinking of Red Sorghum where he – you know, there's always something – you know, related to a political matter, even if he's, his writing is not necessarily, uh, it, even if that specific piece is not necessarily all that political. Oh, yeah, a lot of quote-unquote rural writers tend to sort of put their uh, political concerns front and center. Yeah, I guess, Nick, let me ask you. So, the uh, did you did you find this to be, do you find Jia Pinghua and this particular story to overall be uh, fairly lacking any kind of political flavor? Um, well, I think it's, it's, it's tricky when you talk about lacking political flavor because, um, <laughs> I mean, you know, obviously any, any political, like even that the absence of politics is a political right. position, sure. right? And so, you know, I, I think that Japing he, um, I would say he avoids talking about things directly. Hmm. Um, he doesn't, you know, doesn't, he doesn't tend to include a lot of, of things like this was the first year of the Great Leap Forward, or this is the first year of you know, the Cultural Revolution or something like that. Um, he does have stories and novels that are set in in those time periods. Hmm. Um, and obviously they had some, you know, they would have had something, some sort of effect on his, his growing up, and, and he's written about them in his nonfiction. So he's actually, in, it's one kind of interesting thing that also ties him, I think, to earlier Chinese authors, is he's better known, in, for a lot of people, he's better known for his nonfiction than he is for his fiction. Hmm. Uh, so his, his short essays, his son one, are hmm. really famous. Um, so he has like a collection of someone that's actually like a bestseller right now in China. Okay. Um, but I, I think this story is an example of kind of one of these stories. It's not exactly a fictional story, not exactly a, a someone. It's kind of some, some, some sort of, some sort of a, like a hybrid in between the two. Mm. You um, said, you said it's not like a, it's sort of a hybrid between the two, between fiction and uh someone, uh, someone, I guess we should translate that's essay, right? More or less. Right, yeah. like, a ca- like a casual essay. Yeah. Um, but I don't know when I, was uh, reading this, I felt like there was a lot of kind of autobiographical flavor to the story. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that that's, that's kind of the, I mean, that's what I would argue is is the takeaway from the story, right, is that Jopping Wah is trying to compare himself to this ugly stone. So mm-hmm. the thing that I thought that was, that was really interesting, I know that you guys kind of really saw a lot in the, this kind of significance of the fact that it was this otherworldly object that came to a rural village. Yeah. Um, but but the thing that really struck me about this story is the fact that the stone is so useless. Mm. You know, that the stone is, and even the title of the story, right? Ugly stone. Yeah. It's a it's a it's a story about an object that's almost you know there's a, an element of revulsion. You know that they want to get rid of this thing. That it's just it's it's not even something that anybody wants to have around. Um, so I think I think in a, in a way um, the Japanese was politics. I would I would kind of argue that his politics are at a very um, personal level. Mm-hmm. He, he likes to talk about his position in society and the position of kind of the the, um, the rural other in urban China today. And it's interesting. So, it's interesting that you mention that because this is, I think this is something that struck me about Jia Pinghua, this, this particular story anyway, and that I do notice about certain other. Uh, rural writers who, as you say, actually do come from the countryside, <laughs> there's less interest in foregrounding sort of obviously political interest and a lot more interest in exploring personal reflection. So in this one, for example, it doesn't matter so much to Jia Pinghua where this village is, how poor it is, 
Did it? Did, did this, the events occur in the, the Great Leap Forward or anything like that? What's important is what people make of this stone and what the narrator makes of it in turn. So I enjoyed, one of the things I enjoyed in the story was the fact that the people in the village are just people in the village. They're not backwards or they're not noble. Uh, they're just they're just folk there and they don't like this rock. We probably wouldn't like it either if we didn't know what it was. Yeah. And that's the story. Uh, and I find that in some ways one of the most political aspects of it because when you in you know in the Maoist era in China when you know the soldier the farmer the worker are being put forth as sort of the archetypal literary figures and subjects this is a response with none of those it's yeah. just a person i think we talked about in our Zhang Ling podcast how not talking about politics is a very political act and i think you and nick have both brought that up and i i think now i'm seeing it more nick can i ask you so you said that you thought that um, Jia Pinghua identified very heavily with the stone. Is that correct? Uh, I know my reading of the story. You know, obviously, he may have a different reading of the story, but that's what I would that's what I would assume he's writing about. So I had a question when I was reading it. I was thinking uh, I was reading it more as a not that he's identifying with the stone, but I mean, you talked about how he grew up in this very rural environment, but his father was a teacher. So he was incredibly well educated in the Chinese classics. And I was thinking that the Chinese classics might actually be what the stone represented, this kind of otherworldly, beautiful thing that just comes out of nowhere. Do you think that's valid? Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's there's a, definitely a valid point where you could say that you know the stone is because um, you know, the same thing I think with the classics is people grew up with these stories. It's not like they don't know about them, but I think it's harder for people to appreciate them in China because um, usually their their experience with the classics is you know through like some sort of uh, like a TV series or, or something like that where it's it very much it's mediated by all these these layers of interpretation. Um, and it's I think interesting. Very few... Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I, was say, I just I think very few Chinese uh, readers today, or very many, very few people, have the opportunity to actually experience these texts firsthand. And it's interesting because uh, you know we, we're making a, a distinction here: is it is it the writer or is it the the classics? But the two are really linked because if the, if the writer, if Jia Pinghua is primarily concerned about the peculiarity of something and the kinds of places he grew up, then the classics scholarship. Uh, writing novels, all of these are going to be seen in a similar way. They're they're not particularly useful, right? And it's not that far from where we are even in the United States. I think about telling people what I do, getting a PhD in comparative literature, doing things with modern Chinese literature, and a lot of people, their eyes just glaze over. Like, why would you do that? What is the <laughs> point of that, you know? Uh, and I, so I kind of identify with this, this notion of this, this stone that maybe it's magnificent, but only if you know exactly what it is. If you don't, it's just a thing, you know? I guess, and I, I think I brought this up when we discussed it last time. One of the things that I liked about this is the astronomer who comes out, he's this educated guy, but in Chinese, the word astronomer is tian wen shui jia. So that literally means like guy who studies the writing of heaven, mm -hmm. something like that. And it's very similar to a person who studies literature, which is just wen shui jia. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't want to make too much of that, but I guess that was kind of my uh, one of the things that kind of spurred me to that reading. Yeah, right. And like and the, another interesting kind of tie into that is also the idea that in Chinese, you know, like in English we say it's it's all Greek to me. Mm -hmm. In most languages we say it's all Chinese to me, mm -hmm. but in Chinese you say it's all Tianwen, right? It's all like <laughs> heavenly writing. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's good. a good. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. And, you know, there are people who will spend their lives studying the Tianwen. Uh, the astronomer in the story does. You could argue Jia Pinghua does because he's, he's writing these stories, but he's also engaging in a level of inquiry that no one he grew up with will likely ever even be interested in. And so you can understand why he would pin a story in which the central thing is not only ugly, but can't even speak. It's just a thing. Yeah, it gathers some water. It gathers sometimes. water, and that's the only time it's actually useful. Is yeah. the chickens are like sweet, a place to drink, you know. Did you? Did either of you find some sort of connection to story of the stone with the the, the detail with the water? I had 
thought about it, but I wasn't sure how much to make of it. I mean, the story of the stone is this magnificent 100, magnificent and magnificently long 100 chapter book. Uh, I do think that there is something going on. I mean, not only a uh, story of the stone, which uh, also translated dream of the red chamber, but also you've got, uh, you know, the journey to the West monkey is a, uh, he comes out of a stone. There's all this kind of weird stuff going on with stones in Chinese literature. We talked about it a little in our Pusong Ling podcast um, on the love of a man and his stone. I, I don't know, I, I guess I didn't necessarily connect it with the story of the stone. I was just kind of putting it, putting this story in the genre of Chinese stories about stones. <laughs> yeah. So Nick, what, what did, did you see a connection with the, the story of the stone? Well, I just remember from reading the first chapter of the Story of Stone, which is kind of a surprising chapter if you're if you're reading about the book from another another somebody who recommends the book to you and say, oh, what's it about? You know, it's about this family, and they they go through all these different you know convolutions, and it's kind of like a Chinese Hundred Years of Solitude or something. Yeah. Um, but, but but what's really interesting is actually that first chapter of the book and the last chapter of the book are these very otherworldly chapters, and there are other chapters, other kind of. Uh, uh, segments in the book that, that take place in like a fairyland. Right? Yeah, that whole That's first, the first chapter. That whole first chapter is pretty mythological, right? Right. Yeah, it seems very, very mythological. It seems like kind of almost like the the beginning to uh, to uh, Journey to the West, right? The same kind of thing where, where this this monkey comes out of a stone. Yeah. So in, in uh, you know story of the stone, it's a it's a boy who is actually a stone reborn, right? And then he's he's got this connection to the Dayu, who is this flower that. Uh, watered him with her sweet dew, or he, he watered the the flower. I remember exactly the relationship, but there was some sort of relationship. They were they were taking care of each other in the in the previous life, and then they're reborn, and so he has to repay her. So one of the things that I it's interesting with Jia Pingwa's story is that he seems to sort of pose the question: What if what if the stone was just a stone? What what if it was just a, a hunk of rock, and no one even knew what it was? It was just a rock, and it only becomes not a rock. When someone is around who is has a perspective that no one else has, so this isn't just a tale of a magnificent rock and no one knows what it is. It's also the tale of the necessity of having a certain kind of perspective to know it's not a rock. If if I could say right. a certain kind of reading or a certain yeah. ability to read, yeah. And it's a lonely one. I mean, that the person is wandering through town. Who knows why he's there? Um, but he, both the astronomer and the rock have skills, have perspectives that the people in the rest of the story do not have. And at least from what we can tell from what's narrated, don't particularly even want to have. And so that seems to me very different than most of the other uh, romances, not romance of Three Kingdoms, but Journey to the West, uh, Story of the Stone. The stone is clearly mythological and imbued with this power, mysticism. Here... It's just a stone. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, the, but there's an interesting suggestion, right, in the story where they, they load the stone onto the truck and they take it, I guess, presumably to some place where people, other people will appreciate the stone, right? Yeah. So they're taking it out of this this kind of this, this rural village and then they're bringing it to, I would presume, you know, to the city. Some sort um, of museum. Where it's going to, you know, right, yeah, it's sit in a museum somewhere and people are going to appreciate this, this stone, not as, a, as an ugly stone, but they're going to say, oh my God, this is a meteorite. You know, this is an amazing thing that we should we should study and we should learn more about. But left hanging, and I agree, because it's an object of aesthetic splendor now, but left hanging is everyone else in the story. Because people may go to this museum and admire it, but the villagers are still going to go, right, but all it really ever did for anyone is gather water for the chicken. <laughs> so enjoy it if you want, but it's really still kind of useless. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if right, we could right. kind of conclude on that, uh, no, or on a quick question. Like, what is the point of usefulness? Is it good? Is it a good thing to be useful in this story? I mean, this is a very Taoist question coming from Zhuangzi. What do you think, Nick? Is it good to be useful? Is it good what to be? I remember uh, in yeah, the story. Yeah. <laughs> in the story, well, that, that is a good question, right? Because you know, in the story, being you know, I, as long as he was useless, nobody really bothered him, right? As long as he was useless, the stone could just stay there and and, and just be in the village and nobody really made a use of him. Nobody, nobody appreciated, but also nobody, nobody moved him. 
Right. But true. Then, then as soon as the stone is, is you know recognized for what it is, it gets uprooted and it gets taken mm-hmm. into this into a, a new environment, which may or may not be a better environment for the mm-hmm. stone to be in. Mm-hmm. So to be put I, on I display, it seems kind of actually worse to be useful or to have your greatness recognized. Mm-hmm. Right. So I think I think there might be there definitely might be a commentary there on that. Uh, it's a very old Chinese idea, though. Is is uh, you know like the idea of being a hermit or a or a Taoist philosopher, you know, is mm. that it's better to be kind of a hermit in the mountains than it is to be recognized and then you know have your talent abused by a, by a, a wicked leader or a, right. a, a despot. I agree. So I'm going to let Nick conclude with that thought. All I was going to say about the story is that we've had a, a good discussion about it, and you can have many more discussions about it, but. If you're the sort of reader who's just encountering some of these things for the first time, just read and enjoy the story. And I think we're going to put a link to it, to your site, onto the podcast where they will be able to read it. Is that correct, Nick? Yeah, so we've got a translation up by um, Eileen and Shen Yang, who are two very famous translators Mm. um, who translate a lot of Chinese fiction, actually translated Story of the Stone. Um, and some other other really famous books. Um, so we have a translation up on the Ugly Stone website that's available um, for anybody to download and read and, and share. Please do. Um, and I also have a post that would, just went live today, actually, on uh, Jia Ping Wang, um, and it kind of summarizes all of his books. Um, so this is available on the Global Literature um, in Libraries Initiative website, so we can put a link to that also yep. on the podcast. Yeah, so. we'll, put, we'll put links to nickstemper.com, The Ugly Stone, and in the website Nick just mentioned for anyone who's interested in more of this stuff, as you should be. Is there anything else you want to say, Nick? Uh, no, I just want to uh, thank you guys for, for bringing me on again. I'm glad it worked out this time. Yeah, uh, hey, it's... Uh, yeah, I look forward to it. Yeah, it's really cool to have, like, uh, I guess a colleague, yeah. essentially, in Chinese literature podcasting. Yeah, well, it's, it's definitely, it's fun to, uh, to get my start here, and um, <laughs> I'm looking forward to, to working with you guys more and more stories. Yeah, cool. cool. All right, well, I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And Nick. Nick Stember. Nick Stember. Okay. <laughs> and this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. <laughs>